Planet of the Apes in 1968 was a huge box office hit and practically saved 20th Century Fox from going completely bankrupt. The famous twist ending became the stuff of movie legend, iconic in fact, an ending that Rod Serling originally came up with, where we see Heston's character, Taylor, realize after he sees the ruins of the Statue of Liberty lying on the beach that he is in fact on Earth. This ending would leave the audience shocked, surprised and wondering what actually lay beyond the statue along that coastline. After a production meeting at the studio, which included studio head Richard D. Zanuck, producer Arthur P. Jacobs and associate producer Mort Abrahams, all came to the conclusion that a sequel to the hit movie had to be made. You've got to understand that at this time, sequels to hit movies was a rarity and a clear risk. Fox also at this time had also underperformed with its high budget films like Hello Dolly and Tora Tora Tora. But the studio were optimistic that the sequel, Beneath the Planet of the Apes, would return the studio to its former glory and perform well based on the clear success of Planet of the Apes. During the creation and writing of Planet of the Apes, there were many ideas and concepts by Rod Serling that were in fact thrown out and never used. His original ideas involved Taylor, after the shock revelation, going off to find old technology, which he uses to go to war against the apes. Other ideas would involve Taylor and Nova boarding a spaceship and traveling further into the future. For the sequel, there was a lot of ways they could go because they had a lot of original material to work with which included some extra ideas and concepts by French author Pierre Boll, who wrote the original novel, which Planet of the Apes was based on, had many great ideas for a story, including a script he wrote, titled Planet of Men, which had Taylor and his son, Sirius, re-educating the primitive humans of Earth and leading them into a victorious battle and uprising against the apes which would cause the apes to regress back to a primitive and savage race. The third script, titled The Dark Side of the Earth, combined the ideas and elements of both Boll and Serling. Unfortunately, this would lead nowhere. With such a mixed bag of ideas, the studio really had nothing to work with, as far as concept and story went. The genesis of this project started with the associate producer Mort Abrahams, who approached screenwriter Paul Den, best known for his work writing the screenplay of the 1964 James Bond film, Goldfinger. I was in London on something else entirely and met with Paul and uh, told him, frankly, I was having trouble with this development of this idea. He said, let me toss it around. And he called me about two, three days later and said, I think I have an idea how to do this. Den made a number of suggestions for the story, which would have Taylor and Nova, after seeing the ruined Statue of Liberty, travel further up the coastline and explore the ruins of New York City in the Forbidden Zone, while Abrahams would come up with the somewhat insane idea of having telepathic mutant humans living underground. Dan's first draft of the script, titled Planet of the Apes Revisited, added many more ideas which made their way into the final film. Like the telepathic mutants worshipping an atomic bomb and a militant ape leader, General Ursus, who is hell-bent on pushing into the Forbidden Zone to expand the ape society into further territories of the planet and wiping out all of mankind. The production of Beneath the Planet of the Apes was faced with a few problems and the budget was cut in half and the film went from a budget of 5 million down to just 2.5 million. Zanuck approached Planet of the Apes director Franklin J. Schaffner, but he wasn't available to direct due to his commitment to another project titled Patton. Originally, they hired known TV director Don Medford, but after the production budget was cut in half, he left the project. They then hired director Ted Post, known for his work on a number of well-known TV shows and the Western Hang 'em High in 1968. They hired him as a director mainly because he was known to have experience 
directing TV and film on a very limited budget and completing projects ahead of schedule. Initially, Post had his reservations about the script for not making a point at all. The producers asked what he didn't like about the script. He responded by writing a letter regarding the dark ending, saying, the loss of a planet is a loss of all hope. And he saw many narrative problems after looking at Paul Den's script treatment. Post worked hard to fix these problems, and after a week of rewrites, ended up with over 50 pages of notes of suggested story ideas. Post even tried to get another writer on board, but the limited budget of the production prevented him from doing so. Den came up with a number of interesting ideas. One was adding a half-human, half-ape child to the story, and they even came up with a number of makeup tests of a half-human, half-ape child. But this idea was quickly dumped by the studio, who deemed this as too controversial, and they saw this as promoting bestiality. Zanuck would approach Charlton Heston to reprise the role of George Taylor. I had told Arthur that I don't think that a sequel will hold without the original star being in it. And uh, they took a little bit of time to, f to scratch their heads about that and finally came up with a solution which hooked Chuck Heston back into the sequel. Dick Zanuck called me and said, Chuck, we have to do a sequel, you know. He said, this film is enormous. I said, I don't want to do a sequel. That's like the Andy Hardy series. And he said, Chuck, I can't make the sequel if you're not in it. And I said, well, you got me, Richard, because we couldn't have made this film if you hadn't given it a go. He eventually agreed to feature in the film, but under the condition that he shoot his scenes during a two week period and insisted that his character Taylor be killed off at the end, then would make these additions to the script to cater to Heston's idea of having Taylor disappear at the beginning of the movie and reappearing towards the end of the film. And in the end, ultimately killing himself as well as wiping out humanity after he detonates a nuclear bomb, making this one of the bleakest endings in film history. Heston remarked, why don't I just set off this nuclear bomb and destroy the world. Heston's scenes were shot over eight days and he donated all of his earnings to charity. It was Zanuck's intention to make this second film the last ape film of the series, but he was fired during production. With the idea of having Heston appear in the film for only a short time, they needed a new protagonist. So they created the character John Brent an astronaut whose spaceship, after being sent to find Taylor, crashes on the ape planet, leaving Brent as the lone survivor of the crew. Originally, Burt Reynolds was considered for the role, but they eventually cast TV actor James Franciscus as Brent. Not only was Franciscus a competent actor, but a natural-born athlete, which was perfect because the shoot was physically demanding. He also bared a resemblance to Charlton Heston. Some of the original actors from the first film would return, including Linda Harrison as the mute woman Nova, Kim Hunter as Zira, and Maurice Evans as Dr. Zayas. Unfortunately, Roddy McDowell would not return in the role of Cornelius. The main reason for this was because he was in Scotland directing his film titled The Ballad of Tam Lin. Beneath was the only Planet of the Apes film he didn't appear in. The scenes we do see of McDowell at the beginning of the film was actually footage from the first film. David Watson would replace McDowell as Cornelius. In the film, Cornelius and Zira would hide Brent and Nova and help them escape into the Forbidden Zone. Cornelius and Zira would ultimately make the journey past the Forbidden Zone to find Taylor's spaceship Paul Richards played Mendez, while Victor Biorno played the mutant Ada Poso, but was also credited in the film as Fat Man. Originally, Ernest Borgnine and Orson Welles were considered for the role of General Ursus. Welles flatly refused to play Ursus, mainly because he objected to spending his time in a mask and makeup. 
James Gregory, was cast in the role of Ursus. Other actors to appear were Jeff Corey and Natalie Trundy as Albina. This was Trundy's first appearance in the Ape series. She was one of the only actors in the franchise to play both a human and an ape. Production of Beneath, The Planet of the Apes began in February of 1969. During production, the script was continually revised. Post worked closely with Franciscus and rewrote the character of Brent, who on paper seemed rather boring and one-dimensional, and gave the character of Brent more depth and scope. Director Ted Post found the film extremely challenging to make on a limited budget and due to the low budget, had to cut corners in a number of scenes, with some of the ape actors wearing cheap pullover masks. The sets used for the mutants, council chamber, and the temple of the nuclear bomb were actually reused sets of the hotel lobby set and Grand Central 42nd Street Station sets from the film Hello Dolly. Producer Erwin Allen would actually use the tiled tubular set of a subterranean New York City in an episode of Land of the Giants and as an electrical power duct in his television movie City Beneath the Sea in 1969. The same set was also used in Conquest of the Planet of the Apes in 1972 as the corridors of the ape management complex. The original Planet of the Apes composer Jerry Goldsmith was invited to write the score for the sequel, but director Schaffner was using Goldsmith for Patton, so Leonard Rosamond was hired to compose the score. Rosamond tried to blend Goldsmith's distinctive score with his own style. Regardless of the bad reviews, Beneath the Planet of the Apes did extremely well at the box office and it would inspire the studio to make three more ape sequels, an animated series and a short-lived TV series. There was a bit of merchandising released with a Gold Key Comics adaptation of the film in 1970, plus Marvel Comics published a different version of the film. As far as toys go, Mego released two series of the Planet of the Apes action figures. General Ursus was included in the second series of figures and was the only character of that line not featured in the prime time Planet of the Apes television series. Beneath the Planet of the Apes was a very bizarre and strange chapter of the Planet of the Apes movies. One thing you can definitely say is that Beneath is a highly original film in its concept and story with its many deep themes and imagery relating to what was going on politically and socially at the time. Beneath the Planet of the Apes is by no means a perfect movie. It has many flaws that can easily be pointed out, but it's still a worthy addition to the ape franchise. And the ending is probably one of the darkest endings in film history. Originally, screenwriter Paul Den's original script had a far more optimistic ending, where we see Taylor, Nova, Brent, and the chimpanzees survive the war, and we flash forward some 50 years later, when both of the species are living together in peace. The film's ending was a pretty blatant way to end the series, but as we've seen, the Planet of the Apes franchise has truly lived on, with three more movies after Beneath, plus an animated series and a live-action TV series, and being resurrected in the 2000s with four more movies. The cult and popularity of the Planet of the Apes has truly lived on and will never die. My name's Jonathan. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this video and like what you see on my channel, please subscribe. And if you would like to become a patron on my Patreon, click on the link below.